Well, good morning. Good to see you all out today. Uh, feels like October instead of May, doesn't it? Man, all the rain last night and today it was pouring during our 8 o'clock service as folks were arriving. I'm glad you weathered the storm and came out and showed up today. Thanks for being here. Um, have any of you ever had a senior moment? I know some... I know some of you aren't old enough yet to have one, but in, in, the rest of you had a, had a we, we had one last week at church, okay? Um, we had Mother's Day gifts for all the women who were at church last Sunday, and uh, we didn't give them out till the third service, all right? So uh, 8 o'clock service, we distributed them, and so we're going to distribute them at this service as well. Reggie? Could I get you, uh, just go down that side aisle and just hand a bunch down. And ladies, uh, for every lady who's here, just please take one. It's our gift for being here last week. <laughs> and if you weren't here last week, who knows if you take one, all right? We'll just, uh, we'll just assume that you, that you, you were, all right? Can, can, uh, you want to just hand them down? Or, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Just yeah, pass them down. If we get any extra at the middle, Sam will come down the middle and pick up any extras at the end of the row, all right? Um, hey, if you are a guest today, you honor us by your presence here. Thank you for coming to New Hope today. We hope, uh, we hope that your, your needs are met and you enjoy the fellowship here today. There are some communication cards in the pew in front of you. We would love for you to take one, fill it out, drop it in the offering bag when it comes by in a little while. We always promise we will not beat on your door. We will not pester you on the phone, but through the mail, we will send information that tells you about the church, about our staff, about our ministries, <clears throat> about our worship services, and hopefully answer most of your questions. So if you'd fill one out, drop it in the offering. Thank you so very much. Um, you know that we are doing greetings now with our announcements. Uh, for about seven or eight weeks, you're going to be seeing greetings from various members of our elder board. I have already, if you've been here the last few weeks, I've warned you that our elder board members, they sort of go numb when the video camera goes on, all right? They completely forget to smile, all right? Uh, it's just like there's a trigger that goes off when the camera goes on, but we want you to get acquainted with the members of our board, all right, and so that you can ask them questions and just, just get to know them a little bit better, and then uh, following their greetings, you will hear some of the most pertinent announcements that pertain to our church family in the coming weeks. Let's draw your attention to the screen, please. Good morning. I'm Ray Steele, a member of the Elder Board here at the church. I'm a little old, don't I? So if this is your first time here, or even your fourth, or your fifth, or your sixth, uh, we hope you enjoy your experience, and we welcome you and pray that you find this a very rewarding church to be at. Tonight is the pasta feed at five o'clock. We'll have a great dinner with a variety of different dishes. There'll be lots of raffle prizes, and tickets for the dinner and the raffle are on sale right now in the pavilion. So join us tonight at 5 o'clock and help our 4th, 5th and 6th graders get to Heartland Christian Camp this summer. Hi, I want to invite you to our Mexico Mission Night on May 27th. It's at 6.30, it'll be in the bridge. And you can come hear about what our students did in Mexico, uh, what our projects, our ministries, and how God just worked through the city. This past January and February, we did the Daniel Plan Bible Study. And we'll be having a reunion for this Bible study on May 29th at seven o'clock here in the sanctuary. This is an opportunity if you've kind of fallen off the wagon to get back on it and kickstart the plan again. If you've been having a lot of success with it, that's great. Come and share that with the rest of the group and help to encourage them. So at seven o'clock, May 29th, and let's get reinvigorated for this plan. Good morning, it's time for the book clubs again. We have four to offer. So if you haven't joined one yet, it's not too late. Just go on our New Hope website and pick out the time and location that best suits your needs and contact that group leader and she can give you specific details. It's a lot of fun, don't miss out, and happy reading. The walking club is right around the corner. Literally, it's right around the corner at Sunnyside and Shepherd. So the next one is Saturday, June 1st. We'll meet there at eight o'clock at the Dry Creek Trailhead at the corner of Sunnyside and Shepherd. If you haven't joined us yet, you're missing out on a lot of fun. So plan on being there and bring a friend. 
Hi everyone, I just want to take a minute to say thank you to all the seniors who came out for the carnival as well as all of the volunteers who gave up their time Monday and helping set up and all of Tuesday. Thank you so much. Well, it's time for us to start the second phase of Build the Barn funding project. We have a very special date that we would like for you to save. It's coming up on the 15th of September. That is a Sunday evening. It's going to be right here at New Hope Church. It's going to be a barbecue and it's free. There's going to be live music. There's going to be a live and silent auction. And we're even going to have a very special country store where you can purchase homemade jams, homemade aprons, all kinds of special gifts that'll be there. And all this is going to go to the barn fundraising project. This is an opportunity for you to invite friends, family, neighbors to a special event at the church and they can be part of helping us build the barn. I hope you'll save the date and invite your friends and family to come join us for that very special evening. All right. Um, I hope you saw that last announcement, September 15th. That's just to put it on your calendar. There is going to be a brisket barbecue, all right? It's free, all right? All the fixings that go along with it. And uh, you can invite your neighbors, community folks, uh, friends you just want to bring. Uh, no church service. It's just going to be a free barbecue. There will be a live and silent auction, a country store. And it's just uh, another way in which we're kicking off the second phase of, uh, of our fundraising for the barn. If you're new to New Hope in the last several months and you've not heard us talk much about it, we've pushed it from October to December. Our goal is to raise $1.5 to $1.7 million to build the building that will come in handy on days like today when we're having the pasta feed and it's supposed to rain. Uh, so, but the barn will come in really, really handy for events like tonight once we get it built. Uh, so we kicked off in October the fundraising, and uh, we raised $1.2 million in the first three months of our fundraising. Uh, so that, that was really good. You guys were great. Uh, those are in, in gifts and pledges, all right? As of now, uh, approximately 700000 of that has come in. Uh, it was available for you to do over a three-year period. It could be a one-time gift, a once-a-year gift, a once-a-month gift for the next 36 months. And so we need to raise about another half a million because we want to pay cash for this. We've been debt-free here for 28 years. We would like to continue to be debt-free even through this building project. And so uh, if you want to know more about it, the picture is in the foyer in the back, and underneath that, there's a red box. There are pledge cards on the side of that box. There are brochures that explain the project, and I'll take another Sunday in a few weeks and kind of update everybody on what that project is, but if you want to know more, you can pick the information up back there or go to our website. There is a short video explaining it as well. All right? Uh, please, would love to have you come back tonight for the pasta feed. I know the weather is not ideal like it normally is for us when we do this. <clears throat> this is what helps send our fourth, fifth, and sixth graders to camp every summer. If you haven't realized it, camp for four, fifth, and sixth graders is $475. Camp is expensive. If family's got two kids, it's really, really expensive. So we do our best to try to at least cut those costs in half and sometimes even more than that. And so that's what this fundraiser is for this evening. You got to have dinner tonight, so come out and have a pasta feed, all right? We would love to see you there. Uh, if you can't come out tonight, but you'd like to help in that project, you can put something in the offering. Just put it in an envelope and write on it, pasta feed. And whatever you put in that envelope will go towards the pasta feed this evening. Let me highlight a few prayer requests that are not mentioned in your bulletin or some updates on those that may have been. Uh, Barbara Dildine was a longtime member here at our church. She passed away in 2009, and her, I just got the call yesterday that her husband, Wayman, passed away, and we'll be sharing in his service on Friday. So please remember uh, their daughter, Barbie, who attends our church. Uh, some of you may have kept up on the news with a, a truck driver out of Fowler that was missing for a few days. His name was Sonny Baines. Sonny and his wife are very good friends of Joe and Mary Avila from our church. Uh, very, very close friends. Sonny was found, and uh, it was not good. Uh, he, he was found drowned. 
in uh, the canal off of I-5. Um, it's very suspicious. We don't know any of the details yet, uh, but he had been missing for about four days before his body was discovered late yesterday afternoon. Sonny was a believer. He knows Jesus Christ. So the tragedy is in the loss for his family of his absence from them. The joy is that Sonny is with Jesus today. Uh, let me tell you a story about Sonny. He was a very gregarious, outgoing, giving kind of guy. Uh, I can't remember if it was this past birthday or two years ago on his birthday. He couldn't be home for a birthday party because he was out driving. He was delivering to his customers. And so what he did that evening is uh, he pulled over, he bought 15 pizzas, and he went to the homeless area of the town that he was in, and he had a birthday party with the homeless. And that's the kind of heart uh, that Sonny had. So would appreciate you remembering the Baines family. He has a son and a daughter, and he had a brand new grandson, all right, just a little over a year old. So please remember the Baines family. Pat Williams from our church uh, shared with me a request yesterday. Her daughter-in-law, Sue, who had been a, a cancer fighter and had been victorious, uh, just found out that the cancer is back. They'll be running some tests this week to find out what the next steps are in that. So please remember to pray for Pat and for Sue and the rest of their family. Dick Kelton, part of our 8 o'clock service crowd, he had a, he had a little uh, mini jack put in his back, and it is creating separation between his vertebrae so that it takes the pressure off the nerve, something fairly new. And uh, surgery went well on Friday. He expects to be back with us next Sunday. But do remember to pray for him as he goes through that recovery. Lenny Bendowski had surgery this past week. Please remember to pray for Lenny. Please keep up to date on the others who were there. Uh, I've got clipboard that's going around. This is to help out Celebrate Recovery that meets on Thursday night. If you could be, and, and we have a list for both of these, but we want to freshen up the list, all right? Many hands make light work, and uh, if you would be available on occasions, once every two or three months, to maybe help provide some child care at Celebrate Recovery, it's a hit and miss thing. Uh, some nights, we don't have any children who are brought with, uh, with their parents, and you're here for about 20, 25 minutes, and then you get to go home. Other nights, there will be a few kids here, and we'd like to have supervision for them, and they help you with the things that you can do. If you'd be available for that, there's a sign-up sheet. Or if you would like to prepare a main dish, all right, for a meal for Celebrate Recovery on Thursday evenings, it's usually for about 30 people. If you would sign up with your phone number and your email address and circle how you could help with either a dessert, a full meal, or a main dish, maybe your small group would like to volunteer to do one night every three months. Uh, just put your signatures on there. They'll follow up with you and see what could be worked out of that. Thank you for, um, for your considerations there. I'm going to ask our rusher to come forward and wait on us together as we have our morning ties and offering. If uh, Shelly seems to be smiling bigger than normal, it's because... Uh, we now have a daughter who has her master's degree as of yesterday. We went to that event. And I know that uh, we are hitting the season between college and high school graduations, and so everybody's going to be busy for the next few weeks, but uh, thank you for your thoughtfulness. We'll be recognizing our grads and our dads on the same Sunday in June. So on Father's Day, we'll be Dad and Grad Sunday around here, and we always have a special gift for every one of our high school seniors. I believe we have 12 this year. And can you believe it? We've got high school seniors from every high school in Clovis, which means our youth leaders get to go to five high school graduations, all right? They get to go to five of them, and I think two in Fresno. So they'll have a busy couple of weeks there, but it's good stuff for them, and we're always excited about this new step in, in, in their lives. Would you join with me as we pray and give thanks for the offering? We'll get engaged in our worship and get into the sermon this morning. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your kindness and your love towards us. You, you love us even though we don't deserve it. You love us in an unconditional kind of love. We, we can't bribe you into loving us. We can't give our way into your love. We can't work our way into your love. You love us just as we are. That's hard for us to imagine because we often have a tough time looking in the mirror and loving ourselves just the way we are. We're either um, starting to look too old or we've got a few too many pounds or we look a little deeper and we discover there are 
inward blemishes like impatience and anger and jealousy and frustration and short-temperedness. And, and Father, we, we say I'm not worth all that much love. And yet you love us limitlessly, unconditionally, without reservation. And so, Father, help us to learn to love ourselves in the way in which you have loved us so that we can in turn look at those around us and express to them the kind of love that you want to be seen in this world. Uh, It doesn't mean there's not accountability. It doesn't mean that you don't give us some boundaries from time to time about the way we live our lives. But, Father, you love us no matter how we live them. Father, I, uh, I share with you needs of those who've gathered today and, and they're going through some difficult times um, in the medical field. There's, there's cancer that's come back and they've got to figure out how to, how to treat it. There's treatments that are currently going on. There's, uh, there's tests that have been, have been taken and given and, and we don't have any answers back yet. I pray for a peace that passes understanding as folks are in the waiting room. Uh, waiting to know what next steps and answers and direction might be. Lord, I pray for those families that are part of our church fellowship who've re- recently experienced the loss of, of, of a loved one, a friend, um, a member of their family. Um, death is part of living. Death, Father, for the believer is the doorway to heaven, which is, is, is better than the happiest place on earth, but it leaves those of us who are behind with an absence of a vacancy and emptiness that, um, that the Lord, you tell us, you, you have a comfort that is greater than our loss. And I trust that we will claim that and, and turn to you to meet those needs as we face them. Father, thank you for the privilege of giving and sharing today. It's the opportunity to express our confidence in you, our gratitude towards you. And the scripture says it's also evidence of our belief in the resurrection, that that you're big enough to do what we can't do in our lives. And so thank you for the privilege of honoring you with this today. We commit this and so much more to you in the incredible name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Amen. It, all right, a whole commercial of just laughter. <laughs> I love that commercial, but you just feel better. Whether you're going to buy an iPhone or not, you just feel better watching the commercial. And what that tells me is we can have influence in the world around us with cheerfulness and laughter. Here's what I believe. If we can laugh at it, we can live with it. And Shelly is living proof of that every single day, all right? Um, The book of Proverbs is packed full of wisdom about our heart. Do you remember how many occurrences in the book of Proverbs there is of the word heart? I told you this last week. Anybody remember? 50, good, all right. There's approximately 50, all right, depending on the translation you may do. And I've even suggested as you're reading through Proverbs, every time you come across the phrase, the heart, just highlight it. Then when you get to the end of 31 chapters, go back, count them up, and see how many that you come up with. But there's nearly 50 occurrences of the word heart in the book of Proverbs. In the last few weeks, we've been looking at a few of those Proverbs, We have discovered that the heart is really the center and the focus of our passions. It's the center of our thought process. It is the springboard for our conscience. In fact, 
The heart is the mind that we think with, the will that we make decisions with, and the emotions that we express our feelings with. Our heart, as described to us in the book of Proverbs, is literally our soul. We've, uh, we've looked at a couple. Let me highlight a few of the Proverbs we've looked at. Uh, we looked at Proverbs chapter 15, verse 13, where it says, A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. In other words, if you're happy in your heart, it ought to show on your face. Some of y'all hadn't been happy in a long time, all right? It, it needs to be reflective on the outside of what's going on on the inside. Well, then we also uh, looked at a second Proverbs of 1430 that says, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. And we spent some time looking at this peaceful heart and, and what it means to live in that kind of relationship with Jesus Christ. We then looked at Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25, which says, An anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. It challenges us to look around and see if there's somebody in the sphere of influence of our own life that could use a kind word because they need to be cheered up. We ask the question, is it possible for people of God to be anxious, heavy-hearted, discouraged, or depressed? And the answer, of course, is yes, it's very possible. We looked at the greatest leader maybe in the history of the world, Moses. He went through a season of depression. We looked at Joshua, the greatest general maybe in the history of the world, and, and he panicked. We looked at Elijah, one of the greatest prophets out of the Old Testament, and he was ready to lay down and die. We looked at Job, and if you know much of the story of Job, he had every reason to want to call it quits on life. And then we also looked at Jonah one of the first overseas missionaries, and Jonah experienced deep depression. And so the reality is, yes, as believers, we can experience discouragement, depression, sorrow. The challenge with us is what are we going to do with it? Are we going to allow those external circumstances to dictate an internal reality? Or are we going to allow an internal relationship with Jesus Christ to control our external expressions. Those are the options that you and I have. We have, um, we looked at the fact that to develop a healthy attitude of cheerfulness and laughter, uh, there, there needs to be four aspects to our life that we need to consider. One, what is a healthy attitude? A healthy attitude is one that's willing to laugh at any moment. It doesn't mean we laugh at everything because some things are not laughable about. But are we willing to laugh at any situation, in the midst of any circumstance? Do we have an awareness of the kind of things that make us laugh? What may make you laugh is different. S some of y'all may have thought that was the dumbest commercial you've ever seen in your life. I got to tell you, it scratched my funny bone. Every time I see it, I just, I, I think of my sister in church, actually, on a few occasions growing up. When my sister gets into a laughing situation, you cannot shut her up, all right? My dad actually had to quit a sermon one time because she was laughing so much. Um, but, but what is it that makes you laugh? And, and are you aware of it? And do you surround yourself with, with, with opportunities to laugh? Um, there needs to be some discipline in our life uh, to expose ourselves to the wholesome laughter and cheerfulness that, that we can find. And then uh, we need to understand laughter is good exercise. Uh, doctors suggest that we try to have a good laugh for about 30 minutes a day, 3% of our conscious waking hours. It will help develop a lighter attitude in our lives. And um, this relationship that we have needs to be, this is not the power of positive thinking. This is not something that you can do on your own. This must be biblically based and spirit-driven all right? So that's why we have to be in the scriptures. It's why reading a Proverbs chapter in Proverbs every day is good for us. It's because it reminds us of what God is prepared to do in this relationship that we have with him. We wrapped up last week with a quote from George Miller that said, the beginning, George Mueller, the beginning of anxiety is the end of our faith. And the beginning of true faith will be the end of our anxiety. And so it's living in a growing, ever-increasing faithfulness in this relationship with Jesus Christ. So we're going to pick up on a couple of more Proverbs today. 
There was, uh, so if you'd like to turn there to the book of Proverbs, we're going to look at 1515. Proverbs 15, verse 15. All right. There was once a boy, a uh, young boy, who would spend uh, in the summer a week with his grandfather on the, the family farm. While he was walking around the farm, he uh, checked out the chickens. They were scratching and playing around there in the, uh, in, the, in, in the chicken yard. And the little boy said, chickens ain't got it. Next, he walked out to the pasture, and there he saw a young colt playing and kicking up its heels in the field. And he looked at that colt and said, mm, horse ain't got it. Little boy went on, looked at the other animals in his grandfather's farm, and made the same comment. They just don't got it. Finally, he found an old, old donkey in a stall inside the barn. It was a long, frowning face. Looked like didn't have a friend in the world. And all of a sudden, the little boy screamed, I found it! I found it, Grandpa! Come look! Come look! Grandpa ran in there, and he said, Why'd you find, son? Why'd you find, Papa? I found an animal that has the same kind of religion you have. <laughs> Unfortunately, that is too often true. Too many people who call themselves Christians do not show, show that they have the joy of Christ living within them. The story is told of two old friends who bumped into one another on a street one day, hadn't seen each other in quite a while. One of them looked very sad and discouraged. He was on the verge of tears, and his friend said, what, what has this world done to you, my old friend? And the sad fellow said, well, let me tell you, three weeks ago, my uncle died, and he left me $40,000. Well, the friend said, man, that's a pot of money. I'm sorry about your uncle, but he was very kind to you. And he said, but, but but that's not all. Two weeks ago, a cousin I never knew I had died, and she left me $85,000, free and clear, cash. And the friend said, man, you have really been blessed in these last couple of weeks. I, sad, but, but, but blessed. And he said, well, you don't understand. He said, last week my great aunt passed away, and I inherited a quarter of a million dollars. Now this friend was, yeah, wow, was really confused. And he said, then, then why do you look so glum? And the guy friend looked at him and said, well, this week... Um, so far, nothing. <laughs> there are some people who just can't ever get enough to keep them happy. And that's what happened. Yeah, some of you are just now getting it. Okay, I understand. That's all right. Proverbs fifteen fifteen informs us that a cheerful, discerning heart will result in a continual feast. Most of you know I love to eat. I travel for the purpose of eating. I go to other places to find new restaurants just to experience something new. Proverbs says, all the days of the oppressed are wretched, but a cheerful heart has a continual feast. A cheerful heart never runs out of nourishment. See, once again, one's disposition has a considerable effect on what our outlook in life is going to be. Life to a cheerful heart is as joyful and satisfying as the day of a party. Our attitude colors our entire personality. We cannot always choose what happens to us, but we can choose our attitude towards each and every situation that occurs. And the way this is done, again, it's not the power of positive thinking, because you will run into sometimes events that are more negative than your positivity. You see, what drives this, what makes this different from the power of positive thinking is it must be biblically directed. It is the reason that we ought to be reading the book of Proverbs a chapter a day every day. It's because there we find these snippets of direction about cheerfulness, about laughter, about joy. It's why we need to be connected to the book because it tells us about who God is and the character that he wants to represent and provide in your life and mine. So it must be biblically directed, not positively directed. It must be Holy Spirit focused. When we become a Christian, the presence of God comes to live within our life. And the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to direct our mind, control our emotions, and provide leadership for our will. The Holy Spirit in a human being 
is the presence of God in us. We were created in his image. And it's not because we have two arms and two legs and two eyes and two ears. It is because we have this divine part of us that's called the spirit. And it was the role of the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, within our human spirit that would reflect the character and nature of God in and through us. This is what happened when Adam sinned in the garden. The scripture says that God told Adam and Eve, the day that you eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, that day you will surely die. Well, Adam and Eve did not die physically that day. They were kicked out of the garden. They were separated from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They could never have entrance into that garden ever again. They continued to live for several hundred years. So either we have a problem and God lied, or we need to understand what God meant by that. What God meant by that is that on that day they spiritually died. And because of spiritual death, physical decay was now in effect. A body that had been created by God to live forever now is going to decay and die, and it did. It is what the Bible then goes on to mean when it says that you and I are born, so physical life, we are born spiritually dead. We have physical life. When we hold our grandbabies in our arms, that's a, that, that's a physical life that we're holding there. But my grandsons are spiritually dead until they come to a point that they can make a decision on their own about Jesus Christ. They do not have the presence of God abiding in them. It is what Jesus meant when he said to Nicodemus, when Nick came to Jesus late at night, Remember the story found in the Gospels? That was the first episode of Nick at Night. <laughs> Nicodemus, late at night, came to see Jesus. All right, y'all are catching on. Remember, we're supposed to smile in church today. And, 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 and Nick, Nick said to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to Nicodemus, Nick, you must be born again. Now remember, Nicodemus was one of the smartest men of his generation very, very intelligent guy. He was a Pharisee, well-educated. And Nick scratched his head and said, Jesus, I don't understand. I'm a grown man. How do I climb back up into my mother's womb and get born again? And, and Jesus says, Nick, Nick, I'm not talking about physical birth. I'm talking about spiritual birth. You must be born spiritually. So that when Jesus, I'm, I'm giving you a huge theology lesson right now. and this, this gets dull and boring if I'm not careful. So hang with me just about three more minutes. Just as there's two births, there's two deaths. Jesus had to pay the debt for both those deaths. And that's what he did on the cross. Do you remember when Jesus hung on the cross and he yelled, my God, my God, my Father, why have you what? Yeah, why have you forsaken me? See, the Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin so that you and I could become the righteousness of God. Jesus had never committed a sin in his life. That's why he was the perfect sacrifice. He was the lamb without blemish. And while Jesus was on the cross, the Bible says he who knew no sin became sin. God cannot abide in the presence of sin. When the Son who knew no sin became sin, the presence of the Father in the person of the Holy Spirit departed from the human spirit of his Son, Jesus, and he left him. From the first time since he was conceived in the womb of his mother, the Holy Spirit of God departed from the Son of God and Jesus hung on the cross, suspended in space between heaven and earth, abandoned by God. My God, you have forsaken me. Jesus experienced spiritual death. Why? Because that's what Adam lost in the garden when he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and he stepped into independence of God and that is what sin is, independence from God. And then what was the next thing that Jesus said? It is finished. What is finished? The debt for our spiritual sin. 
He was already spiritually dead. Now he dies physically. Spiritual death brings physical death. And three days later, resurrection. Jesus had already been restored spiritually. And then three days later, he would be restored, risen, resurrected physically. And so you and I can now have living within us the same person that the Lord Jesus had living in him as he walked upon this earth, the presence of God, the person of the Holy Spirit indwelling our human spirit to do for us what instinct does for the animal kingdom. See, your dog behaves like a dog because it's got instinct. Your cat behaves like a cat because it's got instinct. It can only function within those boundaries of instinct. That's why I don't care how house trained you have your dog or cat. If you leave them in the house too long, what are they going to do? They're going to act like a dog or a cat. They're going to go back to their nature, to their instinct. There are too many Christians who are house trained Christians. They've just been given a set of boundaries and they're learning to live within those boundaries, but they do not have the life of God living within them and they're really not born again. It's what it means to be religious and not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so when we have all that God is for everything that we need in residence within our lives, that is a biblically directed, Holy Spirit focused, faith-based attitude. That is why we can face the worst week in our life and we can say like Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Why? Because in my Father's house are many mansions. If this wasn't the truth, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the way to the truth. I am the way, the truth, and I am the life. I'm the way to the truth, and I'm the truth about the life. And whether it's here or whether it's there, our hearts can be joy-filled because we have the presence of God in us. That's what it means to be a Christian. Velma Seawall Daniels wrote in a book called Celebrate Joy. She gives a striking new meaning to this familiar phrase. She tells of interviewing a man who had made a trip to Alaska to visit people who live above the Arctic Circle. She said, never ask an Eskimo how old he is. If you do, he will say, I don't know and I don't care. And he doesn't. One of them told her that they pressed an Eskimo a little further about how old are you? And when he got asked the second time, the Eskimo said, almost, that's all. That still wasn't good enough for this author, so she asked a third time, almost what? And he said, almost one day. Mrs. Daniels asked if somebody could help her figure out what this Eskimo meant. This one writer said he answered that he had figured it out, but he had to ask a lot of Eskimos over 20 years. He said, here's what I found out. He said, the Eskimos believe that when you go to sleep at night, they die, and they are dead to the world. And then when they wake up in the morning, they've been resurrected and are living a new life. Therefore, no Eskimo is more than one day old. And that is what the Eskimo meant when he said, almost a day. The day wasn't over yet, so it was almost a day. Life above the Arctic Circle is harsh and cruel, and mere survival becomes a major accomplishment. But you never see an Eskimo who seems worried or anxious. They have learned to face one day at a time. Have you and I learned how to put worry and anxiety aside and live today? The old statement's a little quaint, but it's very accurate. Today is what? The first day of the rest of your life. A helpful way to move towards a cheerful heart is to fill our minds and our thoughts with those things that are true, pure, and noble. Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9 tell us how to do that. If you want to turn there for just a brief moment, Philippians chapter 4, one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. If you get to Revelation, go back left. You went too far. But in Revelation chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, Paul writes these words. And remember, Paul wrote these from a prison cell. So not the best of circumstances. Paul says, finally, my brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. 
Paul addressed how you and I should think the right thoughts. He said we need to focus on pure thoughts, not things which are unholy, but things which are holy. When we talk about holy and unholy, we could say, hey, things that are unholy are triple X rated. But, but, but I'm not just talking about that which is ugly and vile, but I'm talking about even the thoughts that are worrisome and stress-filled and frustrated. Those are, those are not holy thoughts. Um, I'm dating myself. How many of you have no idea who I'm talking about if I say the name Corey Tinboom? It's okay to raise your hand if you have no idea who I'm talking about. Okay, all right. Um, she's in heaven now. Uh, Corey Tinboom's family was all captured in the war, the Great War, and uh, all except her sister were burned in the furnaces in Germany. She knew what persecution was. She knew what to be surrounded by death was. If you've never read her biography, uh, I would recommend it to you. Download it on your iPad or go on Amazon and get a used one. They're out there. They're cheap they're these days. It's called The Hiding Place. The Hiding Place. It's a great read. Not very big. Thin book. Came out when I was in my bookstore days at Fresno Bible House. This is about joy and laughter, right? Okay, this is a true story. When I worked at Fresno Bible House, I had, a, I had a customer call and wanted to know if I had the new book written by Corey Ten Boobs. <laughs> That's a true story. Cover their ears, all right? That was a true story. I thought I was going to die. Um, I laughed about like that gal in that commercial that day. Uh, but it's a terrific story. But Corey um, was a frequent speaker uh, at the Billy Graham crusade for many years. And she wrote in her book, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, but it empties today of its strength. And she's absolutely right. It means we're trying to do life with our own strength and not God's. We need to focus on truth-filled thoughts, all right? Uh, not those things which are false or make-believe. We need to focus on noble things. Did this thought come from God? That's why we need to be in the Word on a regular basis. We, we need to focus on reputable thoughts. We don't need to be tearing other people down. We need to be building them up. We need to have lovely thoughts. We need to have gracious thoughts towards others, Again, it's not entitled to insult them. We need to dispense thoughts of grace, not gossip. We are to have thoughts that are praiseworthy. We are to have excellent thoughts, not thoughts that are filled with fear and failure and false facades as our focus. Now, there is merit in thinking and acting positively, but the Bible declares that true spiritual joy comes from deep inside, and it spreads to our faces a daily walk with God can produce a merry heart if we're focusing on his blessings. Great gratefulness assures a continual feast of spiritual provisions at God's table. And when we're happy on the inside, our faces will know it. Paul said in, in Philippians chapter 4, he said, rejoice in the Lord always. And he said, in case you didn't hear me the first time, let me say it again. Always rejoice in the Lord for he changes not. Our attitude affects our altitude. That is, the attitude of our spirit affects the altitude of our life. We often hear people say, I would be happy if, if I got the raise, if my kid turns out right, if I could make more money. And the reality is, if we get more money, it's not enough. If our kid turns out good, we're going to always think they could have been better. If we get the promotion on the job, we're thinking we ought to get the next one. We need to learn that in our relationship with Jesus, we can be happy, joy-filled right now. There's a lot of ladies here wearing a shirt. Ladies, would you mind standing quickly if you wore the shirt today? Just stand up real quick. If you wore the shirt, all right? Just turn around so people are, oh, open up your sweaters if you got them there. Yeah, yeah. Look what it says. Choose joy, all right? That was their... Um, that was their shirt at the women's retreat this past, uh, last year. And, and, and it's absolutely correct. Choose joy. We have joy because literally what that means is choose Jesus. If you have Jesus, you have joy. That brings me to the fifth proverb for just a brief moment. Chapter 15, verse 30. A cheerful look brings joy to the heart and good news gives health to the bone. Don't, don't you love it when somebody says, hey, do I have some good news for you? We can't wait to hear it, all right? 
especially if it's our kids and they've been married about nine months. We, we just can't wait to hear that news, all right? It, 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 it excites us. It thrills us. The person who anticipates the blessings of God has every reason to be cheerful. Life holds no terrors for them because they have long determined that their course will be a humble walk with God wherever it is that he leads. Even death holds no mysteries for us as believers because we know that our strong refuge, Jesus, he is eternal. With a sense of adequacy for life and the assurance of victory in death, we can experience cheerfulness in our day-to-day walk. Unfortunately, this is not always exemplified in the Christian behavior. But the understanding of the reasons for a cheerful heart should be carefully taught to those who don't know about it yet, and we ought to strongly reiterate it to those who have chosen to forget. The reason that the demonstration of cheerfulness is so important is a lot of people today need to see real joy. Do not misunderstand anything I've said over the last few weeks. Joy is not gushiness. Joy is not jolliness like old St. Nick, though that's not bad. Joy is the perfect acquiescence to God's will because the soul delights itself in who God is. Let me wrap this up. Okay, I'll ask you another name. How many of you know who Johnny Erickson Tata is? How many of you have no idea who Johnny Erickson Tata is? That's the overwhelming majority of you. I am getting so old. When I was at the bookstore, her name was Johnny Erickson. Tata is her married name. Another book I'll recommend to you, 18 and No Time to Waste. It's a young girl who at 18, just graduating from high school, the world by the tail, beautiful, sharp, Just everything going for her. Believer. She dove into the lake. Her head hit a rock. She became a quadriplegic. John Erickson taught it with the help of some specialized equipment. Was able to have minimal use of her fingers. But she earned a living by becoming an artist. Painted with her teeth. Beautiful, exquisite work. She became an author. She became a speaker. She was good friends of Chuck Colson's with Prison Fellowship. In fact, last time I saw, we had Johnny in Fresno when I, my days at the Bible House, and then last time I saw her was at Chuck Colson's memorial service in uh, Washington, D.C. She went on to marry, and um, like I said, in the Christian community for probably 30 years, she was very well known. It was an article in Decision Magazine that she had written for. That's Billy Graham's Association's magazine. She wrote this story. She said, honesty is always the best policy, but especially when you're surrounded by a crowd of women in a restroom during a break at a Christian women's conference. One woman putting lipstick on said, oh, Johnny, you always look so together, so happy in your wheelchair. I scratch my head sometimes and wonder why people say the things they do. She said to Johnny then, I wished I had your joy. Several women around nodded, and the lady went on to say, how do you do it? Johnny replied, I don't do it. In fact, may I tell you honestly how I woke up this morning? This is an average day, Johnny breathed deeply. After my husband Ken leaves for work at 6 a.m., I'm alone until I hear the front door open at 7 a.m., and that is when a friend arrives to get me up. While I listen to her make coffee, I pray, Oh, Lord, my friend will soon give me a bath. She will get me dressed. She will sit me up in my chair and brush my hair and my teeth because I can't do it myself. She will then send me out the door for a day of work. I don't have the strength to face this routine one more time, Lord. I have no more resources. I don't have a smile to take into today. But God, I know you do. Can I have yours? I need it desperately. So what happens when your friend comes through the bedroom door, one of the ladies asked. I turn my head towards her, and I give her a smile sent to me straight from heaven. It's not mine. It's God's. And so, whatever joy you see today was hard fought this morning. I have learned that the weaker I am, the more I need to trust in God. 
the more I trust in God, the stronger I discover him to be. Are we making that discovery? Billy Graham preached a message in Texas in 1965, and he said, one of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. You might not be able to work up joy in yourself, but God, the Holy Spirit living inside of you, can produce that joy supernaturally, and a Christian should have joy. He went on to say, but a Christian is to have joy. That's one of the greatest characteristics the Christian should experience is joy. And if you don't have this joy, if you don't have this peace that Christ gives you, you'd better search your heart and find out if you really have Christ. And I would challenge you with the very same question today. If you are uncertain of that kind of joy, then why don't you become certain about inviting Jesus into your life? Because this is the fruit of the Spirit that he brings to every one of us, not special ones, to every single one of us. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you know every person who's in this room. You knew they would be here before the service ever started. Father, I got up extremely early this morning because sleep just did not come well last night. My day started much like Johnny Erickson reiterated the way she started her days, and that is, God, if anything good is going to come out of this day, it's going to have to be because you do it. Mentally, I'm not at the top of my game but, Father, I've come to believe that when I realize I can't and I trust you for what you can, who everybody's much better off. And so I pray that, Father, today over this last half hour as we looked at the source of joy and the presence of you in us and the person of the Holy Spirit is the authenticator and the distributor and the expression of what an internal joy is all about there's someone here in the service today, whether they've been coming for years or it's their first time, I trust they take seriously what Graham challenged a bunch of Texans with in 1965. If you don't have joy, you better check to see if you have Jesus. And this would be a good moment for us to make sure we have Jesus if we're unsure. There's no fancy formula. There's no special procedure. There is just an honest confession that says, God, I've done life all on my own up till now. I've tried to be positive. I've tried to be educated. I've tried to be successful. And I've, I've done it every way I know possible. And yet it just still seems to be this void. So Lord Jesus, I'm, I'm ready to surrender. I'm ready to invite you to come live in my life. Father, thank you for hearing that prayer. The simplicity of that prayer is why some people never put their trust in you. They simply say, well, it can't be that simple, and yet it is. A humbling of self and a dependence upon you. Lord, the vast majority in this room are already believers. They already know you. Really, but, but Father, they haven't let their face experience what their heart knows to be true. So I pray, Lord, that there'll be some who will Pray for a connection, Lord, between spiritual truth and real life expression. I grew up in a generation with a song that said, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. And yes, it does. But Father, what this pretty cold, hard world, especially in this country right now, needs is to see people who have a joy that cannot be destroyed by situation or circumstance. Who can see people laugh even in the midst of crisis, not because we're insane, but because we're people who trust in a God that is bigger than our circumstances. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen.